Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce our panelists to you. We have Jehan Jairathnam, Global Head of Compliance Services and Country Head Sri Lanka for Equity and Knowledge Partners. Isuru Tilakavardhana, Deputy General Manager, Human Resource Management, Commercial Bank of Ceylon PLC. Ishan Bhattanarayana, Director, HR Group and Country Head of Sri Lanka, Good Hope Asia Holdings Limited. Manu Sekram, Founder and CEO of 99X and Founder, Startup X Foundry. Our moderator for the session is Leo Fernando, CFA, member of the Employer Outreach Committee, CFA Society Sri Lanka, and founder Travel Lanka Compass. Ladies and gentlemen, can we have a big round of applause for all our panelists? A big hand, and I hand over to our moderator, Leo Fernando. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Oh, it's evening at this time. Uh, Thank you for your participation at today's uh, HR forum. From my end, I would like to make this an interactive uh, session. I plan to uh, open the floor earlier to ask questions from our panelists. Uh, please tap into their experience and learnings, and let's bounce off uh, ideas on how to navigate through a brain drain crisis. Professor uh, Prasadini, uh, thank you for your presentation and providing us with some insights into the brain drain, brain drain crisis. Uh, uh, a data validation uh, question which I have to start off uh, the panel discussion. 16% of your survey respondents are from HR practitioners with a further 15% uh, engineers. Are these numbers a fair representation of uh, the professional workforce? And does it in any way affect the conclusions of your presentation? Yes, thank you, you all, for that uh, question. And it's a very uh, important one. Uh, actually, uh, we have done a survey this is not a uh, scientific research. The difference between uh, uh, scientific research and a survey, uh, if you are doing a scientific research, there are well accepted methods and tools that uh, we must adopt to do the study. But here, of course, whenever we are doing a survey, we have the freedom to choose our own method and the tools. Uh, so therefore, we are not supposed to follow scientific research methodology to do a survey. But anyhow, anyway, uh, when it comes to the sample that uh, we have taken here, the total sample is uh, 2,946 Sri Lankans uh, responded to the, uh, the participated in the survey, out of which 16% uh, for example, as you have mentioned, uh, are HR uh, professionals, 16%. If we consider in a scientific way, there are various uh, methods to select a sample. If I take one example, one of the most popular methods to select a sample, uh, there is a sample table uh, or sample calculator. If you use that, according to a particular uh, population, it gives, it provides the required sample size. According to what we have taken here, HR professionals number, 16% percent, percent, uh, representation, out of 2,946 uh, total respondents, 16% means 300, approximately 370 HR professionals participated in this survey. According to the uh, Kurgis Morgan table, the 370 uh, sample the related population is 10,000. I don't know whether uh, Sri Lanka, we have uh, 10,000 uh, HR professionals in Sri Lanka, but we can, anyway, we can. Uh, when it comes to a uh, population like 100,000, according to the table, the required sample size is 384. So I believe this is an appropriate sample size. Thank you, uh, Professor, for the detailed explanation. Um, 
my question goes to uh, Mano. <laughs> a person with uh, interest in the IT industry. Uh, based on uh, the presentation, the intention to migrate is very high among IT professionals. My question is, how do you retain talent in a hostile condition? The intention for IT to migrate, I just want to in perspective, uh, IT migration has been there for a, for a long time because there's a global opportunity for talented people, right? And uh, with COVID, working from home, and this concept of remote work, and uh, so our business models about the digital workforce has changed. And uh, then with the economic crisis, now people can hire from in there. The demand for digitization post-COVID has gone exponentially higher. So there's a big demand and there was a massive demand for it to migration. Of course, the survey reflects one part of the story, people need to migrate. IT workforce will always because world uh, for an IT guy, it, it, it is market is global. And you're serving the global market, so that's a typical difference. So, just to put it in perspective, but nevertheless, it's very high. I mean, our trade for the first time is touching almost 70 percent. They lost 100 people in the last uh, uh, 12 months, so that's one. So, how do you mitigate this? Is, 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 as a company, I'll only share my experience. For one, is uh, as a business. You have to have your risk mitigation strategy for any venture. So it's not that we got up one morning and said, you know. So we know our greatest asset in the companies are in talent. And we always simulate and say, what will happen? The best 20% need, what do we do? How do we retain them? So this has been always a constant conversation. So when COVID hit and the economic crisis happened, we already knew the data because every year for the last past five, six, seven years, we asked people when I went to migrate and there are incentive for them to be clear and there's a succession plan. So I think from my experience, yes, it was a thing. So we had to come because it was an accelerator, we had to come home to uh, do a few things. One was communication, right? is to communicate the real situation in the country and also to draw on, on history. Because all these events, what has happened, has happened in the past. And it will also happen in the future. So Sri Lanka will also go through prosperity, it will also go through uh, difficult times. So if you really understand that anyway, you take that, right? This is a trend, maybe for the next few years, and it will bounce back, and we have seen our country bounce back. So this is to openly have that discussion. And if you want to mind it, of course you want. But there are two, three things we did. Because there is a lot of people who were on the edge, and they were key resources. What we did was uh, we gave them a same bonus. We just tried to share because we had to. So if you're a uh, well thought of company and you have the resources, you have to have some reserves. So we had staying bonus and said if you stay in the company for the next three years, you'll get a staying bonus. So in this way we we reduce disruption. That's one thing. Second, we will change the entire delivery model. Because we're a consulting company, we have a lot of seniors, so we started changing. And also hiring capable overseas because you need to mitigate the risk. And now we have started an academy where we are bringing people straight from here, but straight in there, and meet people. So, so those are the things we could do to stop the disruption of happens. So i just give you a few examples. Thanks, Manu, for your insights on that, and uh, uh, great highlighting the fact that uh, Sri Lanka has been a country through continuous cycles of disruption and how your strategy of normalizing and uh, taking that into your planning process. Uh, thanks for that insights on that. Um, my next question is to uh, Ishan.
according to the data presented by Professor Prasadini, majority of those looking to migrate are middle level management. In your view, how should organizations respond to the challenge of retaining staff who are identified to fill future senior management roles? Can you find me that? Let's again. We have two mics. So good evening to all of you. Uh, we are talking about retaining the middle level managers. The middle, the middle level manager. Uh, earlier we used to see a lot of migration at the junior levels and the upper levels. But now we see the more senior ones migrating with the economic situation in the country. But I think this is a very critical segment of leaders who can be easily growing into the higher level of leadership. But do they know that they have that opportunity? Do they know that you know I'm being planned for a career growth? Do they know that I'm succeeding into a higher role? I think knowing that will be one way of retaining because then you know that you have a career path. Uh, the next thing is, even though it's a middle level of management, they are also considerably young. So if you take the organizational pyramid, uh, lots of the decisions are taken at the top. And if you take the top age group, they are quite senior. So I think what happens, but they are taking decisions for a much younger set of people who have grown in a different environment, who wants to do things differently, who thinks differently and who has different needs and aspirations in terms of a career. The way they work, how they want to contribute, how they want to go about doing things, the freedom, the flexi work, you know, all that comes in for this young set of people. So I think that top needs to first transform in their thinking, not just change, completely transform in their thinking in terms of how do we change to accommodate the needs of this group. That itself will enable them to be, uh, I mean, be, be more contented with work. That there will be more retention. Of course, some people will anyway want to go. That, that segment you can't. But within the people like Manu said, you know, some people are wondering whether to go or not. Right? That people, if they really change, we, if we change organizations to the way that they aspire to in an organization, then I think that also will contribute significantly for retention. So career path, knowing your career path, and uh, knowing uh, being able to wait, walk the way you want, it's critical. And I think the third thing is to see that the top performance are significantly and very clearly differentiated. Because in the end, you have to really differentiate your top performers, the ones who bring the biggest value. And if you do that, and if they feel that, and if they feel that I'm being differentiated in terms of compensation, rewards, recognition, my ability to contribute to this organization, I think that will also be a significant motivate to stay. Because like the, the opening uh, uh, speaker said, most people leave not organizations, but managers. So the managers have to define this needs space future. Thanks, uh, Jahan. Uh, Jahan, uh, are you seeing a significant level of brain drain in your Colombo office uh, when compared with uh, uh, some of your South Asian officers, just to get a sense of brain drain in Colombo? Yeah, so I think, I mean, for those of you who don't know, I mean, Equity Knowledge Partners has around 6,000 employees, majority of them based out in India. And uh, versus and then we have Sri Lanka. Typically, we have seen higher rates of attrition in India, considering the scale and size of the business in that country. But this year, particularly, we are seeing a significantly higher rate of attrition in Sri Lanka versus India. And largely, I can I think again attributed to the research shared by uh, Dr. Gamani and whatever Manoj suggested as well earlier. It's largely driven by the last economic crisis and people generally moving out at the middle and even junior level, using education sometimes as a reason to migrate and then stay on to basically look for better prospects outside. So 
of the higher percentage, I can say, I mean, just look at the numbers today, 60% of it is for migration of the attrition that we are saying. And now, because of that, you see a lot of migration happening outside in the market, and then quite a few people are leaving our firm to join the local opportunities out there as well. So, this is the general thing that trend is in the market. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Jahan. Uh, next question is to Isru of uh, Commercial Bank. Given your extensive branch network, you have unique insights into brain brain on a localized scale. Have you observed an elevated rate of employed migration that surpasses typical historical patterns? If so, could you provide some insights into specific demographics such as age, educational skills that are migrating from your branch? Yes, uh, traditionally we are an organization which had very low turnover percentages. Uh, it's about two, three percent. That was the historical rate, but it has gone three times higher. So that is uh, uh, quite a strain from our operations. Uh, basically, uh, the age group is what Dr. Gamage uh, showed here also: junior to uh, middle uh, uh, level employees, and starting from about age of 22. 35, 40, that's the most uh, prominent uh, age group. Uh, but, but again, I see more urban crowd going than the rural crowd because we, because, because we are island wide. So we see the more urban, the more uh, exposed crowd try to uh, go out. And most of them left on actually not on migration visas, but on student visas. So this is the pattern we saw, like they took student visas, people who had uh, quite a good education applied for master's degree, and then they have to depend on the strength of that because the country is opening an opportunity for their spouse to accompany, and children, the children also uh, allow. So with that, uh, it was like a family migration, but based on a uh, student visa. So we started losing people, the, the smart ones in the lower to upper middle level. That that has been a pattern, but it has kind of slowed down a bit now. I think we have passed the peak of that. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, it remains a, a challenge because we are industry, we build knowledge. Uh, uh, to build a bank, it takes a long time, the experience. Uh, and we are an organization that we take a school leave and build him up to CEO and director level. I mean, historically, we have done it for many, many years. So, some people who had the potential, they saw the promise and they were told that there is a that the way up and you are, there's a place for you still. Uh, they, uh, they, 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 they had been their decision, so it was uh, sometimes sad, but nevertheless, you have to understand their reasons, uh, sometimes the social, sometimes family reasons. Thanks, uh, uh, Just a quick one to the audience we like to make this uh, session quite interactive and we would like uh, you all also ask questions from the panelists and tap into their experiences and learnings so uh, uh, could uh, the staff please ensure mics are being shared around uh, and also from the audience please do ask uh, questions and let's make this an uh, interactive session uh, Professor Prasadini, uh, building up on Mano's point which he highlighted earlier, uh, how does the current migratory trend compare with Sri Lanka's historical migratory shocks like 83, 89, 95, etc., 71? Actually, uh, like uh, this uh, brain pain has been happening in Sri Lanka for last uh, couple of decades. But uh, I, I would like to answer that question, Leo, based on uh, the findings uh, of the survey. Uh, actually, uh, we took uh, two samples for that. Uh, those who have an intention to migrate, the Sri Lankans, as well as those who have already left the country. And we asked from them, uh, we, we gave them same choices. Why do, uh, the, from the Sri Lankans, right, what, uh, what, uh, what are the reasons for your migration? 
and those who have already left, why you have left the country. When we consider the answers given by them, we can identify there are uh, common answers. They have highlighted as the most prominent answers. For example, both uh, samples highlighted as one of the reasons, lack of essentials, facilities such as transport, health, uh, etc. Both parties, those who have already left the country as well as those who wish to migrate, both of them highlighted it as one of the prominent factors for migration and also uh, education for their children. <coughs> education, the quality of the education, they are not happy with the quality of the education and they want to give better education for their children as well as there is no proper law and order in the country. And uh, those are common reasons. Right? It is not applicable to the current scenario, but even in the past, uh, we can make a, what is it implied? Uh, the governments came to power in the past and as well as the present. They have not done enough investments in infrastructure to develop infrastructure as well as to modernize the education system in Sri Lanka. But when it comes to uh, the, those who intend, uh, in, those who have intention to migrate. They have highlighted uh, the main, the most prominent reason is uh, there is no vision and leadership for the country. Because uh, we know that uh, everybody uh, in this country uh, was affected with the, uh, everybody had that bitter experience of the economic crisis. And even uh, after the economic, during the economic crisis, uh, we saw that uh, some of the positions were changed, the Prime Minister's, uh, the President's position and the Minister's positions were changed, but still we cannot see any uh, progressive plans to develop the country, how to uh, develop exports or how to gain uh, more foreign currency to the country, still we cannot see any progressive uh, plans. Uh, thanks, uh, Professor. After this question, I this question I just like to go a few decades back into a crisis period, and I would like to ask this question from Ishan. But we, and after that question, I would like to open up the floor for to the audience to ask uh, their question. Uh, Ishan, during the mid 1990s, I suppose it was a similar period of chaos. There was lots of stuff happening around. People didn't see futures, people are migrating. Uh, but several forward looking IT and garment industry players made strategic investments in their workforce, operational processes, and technology, enabling them to uniquely so they enabled them to identify unique market niches and distinguish themselves from competitors. As a person who has seen through that life cycle from those two industries, could you kindly share your insights and lessons learned from this transformative journey, which will be helpful and ins inspirational to uh, the HR teams here? Okay, so I'll throw a question back again. <laughs> What's your biggest uh, differentiator today in business? Right. If you really think access to finance is not too difficult, technology is available, right? innovation, automation, all of this new data, all that you can have. But what is your biggest differentiator? That is what they saw so many years back. Your biggest differentiator is your talent. And if you have the right talent, I mean the right talent, I'm not saying just head count, but if you have the right talent, all the rest can come. So they saw that, okay, investing in talent, growing talent, enabling talent to contribute at their best, harnessing the best potential that they have, and attracting the best in terms of talent can create that huge differentiator because they will advise on how to change your structures, how to bring innovation, how to be customer-centric, how to drive AI, all this will completely transform your business. So they saw that much earlier. That's cross the visionary leadership. 
and that's why some of the industries at the time paid and attracted at very high rates, far ahead of others, because they knew this is the differentiator. And today it's proven because today in this global village, you can work in any part of the world, and talent can work in any part of the world, from any part of the world. So which means talent is your differentiator, and they saw it far ahead, and that was the differentiator for their business. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the audience? The, do you have the mic, sir? Sorry. Until uh, we get the next, maybe I'll, I'll ask a question from uh, Mano till. Uh, the mics go around. Uh, sure. Mano, as a person who has successfully attracted investment, foreign investment, mind you, to Sri Lanka on your unique uh, story of uh, game changing work which you have done, uh, I would like to ask because we, we, we focus quite a lot on culture, corruption. There were so many words thrown around, sure. right? My question to you is, what do investors look for in a corporate culture? Okay, um, so when investors look at your company, they look at different aspects, but specifically, if you ask me, Leo, when they look at culture, the first thing they look within the culture is about ethics and credibility. It's very important that they want to see this is an ethical company and leadership has credibility. That's number one. Number two is the level of employment, employer engagement, right? Whether it is a toxic company, whether there is a um, culture of team, comradeship, and they are able to execute things together. Um, the other one is the culture of excellence, whatever you do, whether it is innovation or serving the customer, is there is excellence. Can they deliver excellence? Diversity is very important. Do you respect diversity? Is your culture based on openness, uh, diversity for different um, in gender, race, different way enabled people? So diversity is very important. And finally, because the culture is open, you, know, you don't get um, reprimanded because you challenge, you know, you voice your opinion, you are a whistleblower. So those are the essence they look into the heart of the culture. And this is very fundamentally important, like I said, if you want to be an international player, if you want to take Sri Lanka, I think the change is within us, right? We can say, yeah, politicians are done. But if you can be that example and then and, and the rest, of your peers and then the country before you. Thanks, uh, Mano. I think uh, uh, to build up on that point which you said, which is very valid, because one thing which Sri Lanka miserably fails, most companies, is fail is to attract uh, foreign investment sure. into the company that, given our very low savings rate as a country, it's important that we attract significant amount of foreign investment. So it's, it's, it's a big challenge to all the HR teams to take note on what Mano said, to build that culture, that strong culture, which is focused on ethics uh, in your company. Um, my uh, uh, question is to Jehan. Uh, you operate a network of delivery centers uh, in countries marked by intense competition within internal labor markets. Could you kindly provide insights into your strategies for talent acquisition and retention? Is it to Sri Lanka or uh, across the region? Across. Uh, you, you all have offices in uh, India. Yes. In yes, got it. So I think when we look at it, we have two hiring pools, right? And you have, I mean, you take India or you take uh, the locations are. Costa Rica as well as in Beijing. And then we also place our resources in locations like New York and London. 
Um, you have two pools that we are bringing. We are bringing the mid-level or senior level or experienced talent from the lateral force or what we call more from other firms that they have a prior experience working in with big seniors. So rest of it could come from a fresher talent pool from the university system or the education system that they particularly have in those countries. So we work with both these groups largely with the laterals, it would be through hiring agents or through our direct sourcing methods. And for the universities, we have been, for example, in Sri Lanka particularly, we work very closely with the universities, with the respective have partnerships with we have partnerships with almost 15 universities, direct partnerships, working with them, working with different faculties to work with them on the curriculum, see whether we can give some input as far as how they can come up with the talent that we need, bring their resources in as intern on internship programs or programs of good nature to make them more familiar with what we do as well as also align them to our requirements when we want to hire them. So this basically helps us to get the right talent hopefully in the markets that we require. When it comes to a large market like India, you throw out a profile, it doesn't take much effort to basically line up hundreds of that particular profile that you require. Uh, because we are feeding off a huge ecosystem of captive talent that is available, either who have worked in similar industries or from a university network that is large, which is not the same as you come from in Sri Lanka. So working closely with the universities has been a very successful endeavor. We are extremely, I mean, personally, I have been very impressed with the amount of commitment that the local academia has to make sure that the talent is ready for us. It's quite, I mean, ironic considering the differences in pay scales or sometimes of the people that we hire from there, the amount of effort that they put into basically making sure that talent is ready. I mean, they'll bring them into programs, they'll change the curriculum, they'll give them assignments that are relevant. And if we can work with them continuously, I think that would be the best backfill that we have for this application that we're dealing with. Apart from that, we also make sure that we have the values that Mano mentioned. Make sure that we have a diverse and inclusive culture, uh, the meritocracy that is required to make sure that we provide the right employee value proposition. Make sure you have the right identification of the performance-based culture that is required. Also bring about the fact that because we feed a very young pool of talent, make sure that the working environment is fun. So that they have the right cultural reasons to join the firm and stay with the firm in that sense. We are fine with people migrating. Actually our firm, I mean, for those of you who know our firm, we have been with, we have been in situations where we've seen some of our talent migrate. Those who have migrated have become our clients. So we've actually fed off that as well. But it's, this particular season is where we see a bit of a more frustrated kind of people leaving out of desperation because the other person is leaving, etc. So that is why the shock has been more. But what we need is a bit of field, more talent to come in that we can grow and groom them and then make them more ready to migrate if needed. And hopefully they'll come back and join us. Well, because we've benefited from reverse brain drain as well. We see only that a few people will come back after going there and said, okay, they have personal reasons as the parents or personal reasons to return and we've been able to fit them into the organization again happy. Thanks, uh, Jahan. Uh, Isru, uh, um, the next question is for you. What's your current strategy on SAP development? Uh, and how much of your training budget is allocated for soft skills? And how do you see this allocation uh, changing? Actually, current strategy has two aspects. One is compensation. Uh, because that is something that we need to talk about here, but I think it's very important to talk about some compensation in this, this particular context. The other one is, of course, the, the training and development. Because uh, to attract and retain, we have a strategy of uh, trying to address it through competitive, uh, relevant compensation packages. And we are redesigning some of our existing packages because the value proposition has changed and aspirations of the new generation is different. What we historically offered is of no use to the new generation. So we have to repackage some of the, those things to suit the present day young professionals. So that we are doing. The other one is uh, the investment in training and development. We, uh, we, we do quite a bit uh, investment on that because uh, we actually do people from the lowest level to the Top level. We, we rarely uh, recruit from outside in the middle. Uh, school leaver is built up all the way to the top management. 
So we do invest in them heavily, but normally what happens is that there's a particular pattern which we used to follow, like, okay, in the younger days, we spend more time on them in terms of gains in the banking uh, capability. And then as they go up, we, uh, we try to give them more management and leadership capability, the investment pattern of that. But now this whole situation has changed a little bit. You know, we are losing talent uh, and in the middle particularly. So sometimes we have to change our recruitment practices. So therefore we are now again investing more money into the co-banking capabilities. Because that, that, that to build the vacuum. So uh, therefore training and development investment also has changed its pattern. But uh, both these things to have to go in hand in hand. I think mean for generally for all the organizations as well. Because you need a compensation strategy also to address this situation. That that piece cannot and not be forgotten. I, I can't emphasize it anymore. Because at the end of the day, you have to understand that uh, take example, CFA. CFA is a global price. Whether it's Sri Lanka or in US or in somewhere else, that qualification can uh, earn a certain amount of uh, compensation. So we cannot pay less than we pay a person there. So we need to find a way of paying what that person can earn anywhere in the world within our affordability criteria. You, know, we, you work within a certain constraint, I mean, but what your business can afford, uh, what, what, is, uh, what is the limit. But still, you, know, you cannot lose sight of the fact that this person has a global price as well, because the war for talent is now uh, going in that direction. Thanks, uh, uh, Isru. Um, given the current uh, economic challenges, I think uh, business value proposition changes frequently. Uh, the delivery processes need to be modified to match the changes in uh, the value proposition. My question is to uh, Ishan. Uh, to remain globally competitive, uh, what would you identify as top five facets of organizational culture? I think, uh, you see, culture is something that as soon as you enter an organization, you you identify the culture. It's by the pulse of that organization you can feel. When I went to Google in the US versus Microsoft, you see distinctly different two cultures in IT. Right? So the culture is what you want to define as an organization. So that's the start. Then within the culture, you see all of us go to work, all of you include. When we go to work, we believe that we want to give our best. We want to contribute. None of us say, you know, what we can we want to contribute less or you know, we want to be lazy. No, we want to be contributive, we want to be progressive, we want to be partners of that change. So, but some organizations enable that to a great extent, some to a very extent, less extent. I think what the extent of that, how much we can contribute, defines a lot through the culture of the organization. So I think, I think the culture of the organization is completely influenced by the values. What kind of values do you respect? We spoke about diversity, do you respect? Uh, do you have good ethics in the organization so that you know people know that uh, in terms of values you are value driven? One, two. I think the leadership because an uh, organization has a huge impact through its leaders how they behave. So that leadership becomes very critical. In, and in terms of today, people want an organization where they can contribute, change, transform you know, completely aligned to contribute, to grow, to learn. So uh, organization, that third thing I would say is that organization that gives you growth option. So you want to, you you know that you know, you're growing, you're learning. Fourth thing I would think, uh, think is an organization that has fairness across. Because today it's not about whether I'm paid less or I'm paid more. It's about, uh, it's about whether person who is contributing equal to me is paid less off. So that because that can be a real, 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 huge uh, irritant. And uh, I used to work very close with Ram Char. And what he used to say is, an organization is completely impacted 
by the team alignment, the alignment you have. Because this team alignment creates a huge impact on culture. Because, say, if the marketing and the operations are working very closely together and they have goals which are making each other successful, then for the people who work in marketing and operations, it makes life that much easier and that much more enjoyable because now we are helping each other rather than you know competing against each other, not cooperating with each other. So I feel that team alignment becomes very critical. So if, if you have these things in a culture, I think it really impacts because like they say, you know, strategy is eaten by culture, right? Uh, because you can have the best strategies, but if your employees are not geared to contribute towards those strategies, then you're not getting your best. And how well the employees contribute is completely, I think, impacted by the culture and the values of the whole so, um, Leo, I don't know how many people will ask you questions, but I just want to make a comment. Uh, we saw Dr. Gamage's uh, presentation, and of course, we can be depressed or you can take it as an opportunity, right? At least for me, I see at least 40% want to remain, and let's focus on the 40%. Because if you complain and say, okay, the leadership is not there, um, and you know, there is no future. I mean, we're all responsible for that. And it is who, we are the ones who can make a change. This is not Gaza, right? You know, people are not leaving because bombs are falling down, right? We have an economic issue. Um, and that has been there for the last 70 years. It is not just, we have been a consumption economy, we never produce. And we want the same people over and over again, right? And we want no taxes, but we want infrastructure, right? So I think we're all responsible. So I think it is to look and say, okay, what is the future? Focus on the people who believe that this is the future. Sri Lanka is the country of the future and work within that. I think that is very, very fundamentally important. If we look at all these statistics, I agree with the statistics. But even in the West, it is not rosy, right? You will have, you will go through all this right Today there is a war in Ukraine, nobody talks about it. I work in Europe, I know how much uh, anxiety is because tons of events can change, right? So I think we have to be very positive, right? We have to believe that there is a future and it is left for among us to make that future, right? So how much ever you can say, but I think everyone has to focus and say, what is that it takes to the next level? Definitely I agree it is a talent, right? Because I think we have to go up the value chain. You know, we are no longer in labor arbitrage. We have to innovate, we have to be creative, and we have to attract investment to make our country and companies attractive. Thanks, Pano, uh, for that insight. In fact, uh, my uh, final question to all the panelists was under 30 seconds, what's your key takeaway message to HR leaders? And I think Manu, you have used the 30 seconds. <laughs> So, uh, uh, my, uh, and, and also Mano highlighting the point, the most transformative period during Sri Lanka's corporate history happened during a time where bombs were actually good in this country. So currently we don't have bombs, but we have peace, uh, just land of opportunity. Uh, uh, Professor Prasadini, in, in uh, under 30 seconds, uh, what's your key message to uh, HR leaders present here? Okay, Leo, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, today uh, we have to work with uh, the majority of the workforce uh, represented by Y generation and Z generation employees. And uh, being leaders, you must be able to understand uh, their requirements, their grievances, their talents, their motives. Uh, etc. And you have to treat them accordingly. Uh, we call it emotional intelligence. Thank you. HR? I would say as HR always balance the interest of people and business, understand the importance of both. Always talk numbers. Remember that uh, you set up the process that talent can be differentiated, identified so that you are recognizing the best people. 
and always remember that you know your reputation is your shadow. What you do it becomes your reputation. I think the main point I would say is that the Vichar Commissioners, drawing from what Manu said, we have a 47 percent who are not willing to, not interested in going right now, as well as we would like to focus on what we can do to retain them and go below that layer to make sure that we convince them. And as this Vichar Commissioners, you all should look at gearing an organization to convince that population of how you can attract them and keep them convinced about the reasons to stay and uh, focus on those areas and try to build, work with the universities, work with the schools to basically develop the right talent to then come into the workforce for us. Is true? Uh, I would say that believing the people who are remaining, believing their capabilities to rise to the occasion, change the employee value proposition to suit the present day generation and the circumstances and invest in them. Yeah. Thanks uh, everyone. Before we wrap up today's session, i just like to share with you one slide uh, which summarizes a key message from Professor Prasadini's uh, data which she presented. Could, could we have that uh, slide up here? It basically captures the aspirations of people looking to migrate versus the feedback from people who have migrated. And based on the decisions of their migratory, it comes the only time the actuals have surpassed their aspirations was when the migratory decisions or the feedback was related to electricity, transportation, healthcare, and children's education. In all other situations, technically, it didn't surpass their expectations. Uh, my final going away message to all of you is every challenge we all face has one thing in common, an opportunity. Good evening, everyone, and have a good evening. Thanks. What an insightful panel discussion, ladies and gentlemen. Now, we have some tokens of appreciation to be given away to our panelists. We'd like to invite Mr. Aruna Pereira, CFA, President, CFA Society of Sri Lanka, to please uh, come up on stage to hand over the token to our keynote speaker first, Professor Prasadidi Agabage. Ladies and gentlemen, a big hand for uh, Mr. Aruna Pereira as he makes his way to the stage. Once again, a round of applause for our keynote speaker here today, Professor Prasadini Gavadi. Thank you very much. Also presenting a token of appreciation to Arthi Porowo, Country Head, India CFA Institute. Can we have a round of applause for Arthi Porowo as she makes her way to the stage to receive her token of appreciation. Come on, everyone. Let's keep our applause going. Thank you very much indeed. A big hand for Arthur Pereira, our country head, India CFA Institute. Well, thank you, thank you very much to Mr. Arna Pereira. We'd like to invite uh, Rashmi Piris Parnavithan, Vice President, CFA Society Sri Lanka, to please come up on stage to give away the next tokens of appreciation. First token to Jahan Jairatna, everybody. A round of applause to Jahan Jairatna, Global Head of Compliance Services and Country Head, Sri Lanka Equity Knowledge Partners. Our next token is to Isuru Tilakwapana, our Deputy General Manager, Human Resource Management, Commercial Bank of Ceylon. We'd now like to invite to the stage Seneca Keki Varagodage, CFA Chairman, Employer Outreach Committee, CFA Society Sri Lanka, to come up on stage to give away the token to Ishan Vampanayarayana, the Director HR Group and Country Head of Sri Lanka, Good Hope Asia Holdings, PLC. As well as to Ms. Manos Sekram, Founder and CEO, 99X and Founder Startup X Foundry. Let's have a round of applause, everybody. And once again, we need Mr. Arna always up on stage. Once again, one more time, two more tokens to be given away. Can we have Mr. Arna always on stage? Yes, here he comes. A token to our moderator, Mr. Leo Fernando, CFA. 
And a token to our special guest today, Sachin Naik, Director of Partnerships and Client Solutions for India CFA Institute. And with that, we say thank you very much to our presenters and thank you very much indeed to all our panelists. Let's give them a round of applause, everybody. And while our panelists make their way off stage, another reminder about our sponsors, our platinum sponsor, Colombo Stock Exchange, silver sponsor, Equity Partners, Capital Alliance Group, CTCLSA Securities, First Capital, NDP Capital Holdings, Senfin Asset Management, UserPay Sri Lanka, Knowledge Partner, Equity Knowledge Partners, Banking Partner, HMB PLC, Insurance Partner, HMB Assurance, Creative Partner, Salva Colombo, Print Media Partner, Daily FT, Magazine Partner, LFT, Electronic Media Partner, Rupa Mahini Channel, I text messaging partner, textware, candidate resource partner, Alpha Business School. I think we're getting ready to take a picture on stage. In the meantime, to everyone else, thank you so very much for being a part of the session today. There's refreshments arranged for you outside. Please feel free to help yourself, ladies and gentlemen, as we just get into our networking session. Once again, a big hand for all the ideas shared today. Put your hands together, everybody, on behalf of the CFA Society in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thank you.